పేరు మీద తను విడుదలయ్యారు పేరు పై విడుదలైన తర్వాత ఆయన తొలిసారి తెలంగాణకు వచ్చారు తెలంగాణ రాష్ట్రం భౌగోళికంగా తెలంగాణ రాష్ట్రం ఏర్పడిన తర్వాత తెలంగాణకు వచ్చారు ఒక రకంగా ఆయన ప్రస్థానం ఇక్కడి నుంచే మొదలైంది ఆయన మళ్ళీ ఇక్కడి నుంచే ప్రజా ఉద్యమాల్లో చాలా యాక్టివ్గా పాల్గొనేందుకు వచ్చారు ఒక రకంగా చెప్పాలంటే నిన్న వరంగల్లో జరగాల్సిన జరిగిన తెలంగాణ ప్రజాసమక వేదిక బహిరంగ సభలో మాట్లాడే కోసం ఆయన వచ్చారు అక్కడ రాజ్యం ఆయన మాట్లాడడానికి అవకాశం ఇవ్వలేదు ఇక్కడ వరకు వచ్చి మాట్లాడలేదు దాని తర్వాత ఇవాళ మన ముందు నిలబడ్డారు ఒక రకంగా చెప్పాలంటే మళ్ళీ లామక్క నుంచి ఆయన కార్యాచరణ మొదలవుతుంది సో సాయిబాబు గారు తన జైలు అనుభవాలు మాట్లాడతారు మాట్లాడడానికి ముందు వరవరరావు గారు సాయిబాబాకు సంబంధించిన పరిచయము ఆయనతో ఉన్న అనుబంధ పరిచయం పీపుల్ ఎస్ట్రైల్ ఆంధ్రప్రదేశ్ స్టేట్ అండ్ ఆల్సో తెలంగాణ స్టేట్ యు నో ఐఎమ్ ది ప్రెసిడెంట్ ఆఫ్ రెవల్యూషన్ డెమోక్రటిక్ ఫ్రంట్ అండ్ సాయిబాబా ఇస్ ది జాయింట్ సెక్రటరీ ఆఫ్ ది రెవల్యూషన్ డెమోక్రటిక్ ఫ్రంట్ అండ్ ది రెవల్యూషన్ డెమోక్రటిక్ ఫ్రంట్ ఈస్ బ్యాన్ ది ఆంధ్రప్రదేశ్ గవర్నమెంట్ హ్యాస్ బ్యాన్ ఇట్ ఇన్ టూ థౌజండ్ థర్టీన్ ఆఫ్ కిల్లింగ్ గంటి ప్రసాదం వైస్ ప్రెసిడెంట్ అండ్ తెలంగాణ గవర్నమెంట్ ఆల్సో కంటిన్యూస్ దట్ బ్యాన్ ఇట్ ఇస్ ఛాలెంజ్ ఇన్ హైకోర్ట్ Uh, three years back, but uh, High Court has not taken it up by this. Now I was discussing about the senior advocates, Satyam Reddy also, about that. Otherwise, also, both of us are the members of the Revolution Writers Association. Uh, so, and our, our association was with uh, Srujana, a magazine, by, which I, my wife, Hemalata, used to run as a publisher from 1966 onwards. And, uh, as a reader of srujana from amalapuram uh, he has uh, come into the radical politics in his early days and when kulli satyanayana editor of x ray introduced him to the magazine srujana and from his college days he is attracted to the radical politics and later joined radical students union uh, but we directly met uh, only after he joined the hyderabad central committee here i was here i was also uh, banned from varangal city also so i was not expected to go to varangal city in 1990 after my release from jail so then i started living in hyderabad and sai baba came to me introduce himself and one more interesting thing for both of us is uh, of course surjana by radical politics and all that ugi uh, bathiyango is one common point uh, in between us. You must have heard about Gugiva Thiyango, a Kenyan writer, a, you know, very committed anti-imperialist in that way. You must have read all his books, Pets of Blood, uh, Devina the Glass and all those books, I need not tell you. And both of us are really interested in him, in him. after Sri Sri, both of us are admirers of uh, Gugiva only. And I translated his books and now Sai Baba also in his jail life, he translated Googie's autobiography's first part. Uh, that is the <coughs> dreams, dreams during war time. And in his boyhood, he describes in this uh, first part, his second part also has come. And Sai Baba in his jail translated it. And there is an interesting comparison between both of them. Kalula uh, Matadara. Of course, somehow I first started in English itself, which I have not used to speak in Hyderabad, in fact. You can also speak Urdu. You can also speak Urdu. So, what happened was that there was a moment in Kenya. There was a Telangana army struggle between 46 and 51. There was a moment in Kenya in Kenya. 1952 
in the revolutionary movement. And then we, we, when so I started uh, making comparison between these two people, I find very interesting comparison for that matter. Uh, Gugi's brother, if you go through this book in English, you must have said that one was in the Mau Mau movement. And Sai Baba's sister was in the People's War movement. She was uh, in the party and also wife of the Hyderabad City Party's Suresh wife. He was People's War Secretary in Hyderabad City who was killed in a fake encounter in Merak district, Nasapo. Uh, you know, brother went there and uh, he put his uh, shirt on his naked body when he has uh, collected his body. So there are many stories about that, of course, I should not come in between Sai uh, Baba and yourself. Uh, so, interestingly, only one difference, uh, because Sai Baba is younger, he cannot be fascinated by Jawaharlal Nehru, as I was fascinated. And uh, Kenya, uh, Bogi also was very much fascinated by Kenyatta. Uh, who was the, the leader of the national movement in Kenya, but later turned to be, to, uh, to be a bit better comparison like Jawaharlal Nehru, a traitor. And uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, you know, he is responsible for Telangana, uh, the whole army action in Telangana, there was state. Of course, uh, people blame only Patel, but uh, Nehru was clever enough, a Brahminical bureaucrat, uh, to kill 4,000 uh, people and two lakh Muslims in the name of Raza Khas also, Indian Union military has killed. So in fact, uh, I wrote a poem on Nehru and of course Gugi wrote, uh, Gugi wanted to write the biography of Kenya Khan. And this same Kenya Khan, his followers put Gugi in jail. And uh, in Kenya, in high security jail, Gugi spent only one year, but whereas Sai Baba spent first 14 months, a small six months resist given by the Chief Justice of Bombay High Court and then again with very vengeance the Nagpur Division bench has sent him again to the jail on December 25th. First it was 9th May 2013 and again in 2015, December 25th, he was sent to jail and then April 7th he has come out. Altogether, except the six months resist, the, the two, he was conditioned to stay in Heather, in Delhi only for his treatment, medical treatment. And on April 7th he has come out. And uh, as Bogi, he was also in high security jail, Anda cell. Uh, what, is, what is the Anda cell and what are his RDLs in the jail? He will narrate, of course. But those who have read uh, Arun Pereira's uh, book, uh, The Colors of Cage, uh, we will come to know what, what is uh, Anda cell. What is Anda cell in Nagpur High Security Central Jail. You can understand that and of course Sai Baba will narrate those ordeals. Uh, he tortures in fact and you know he is 90 percent. This is one bad precedent. This is one thing. Because the, all the international laws say that a physically handicapped person, physically challenged person with 90 percent disability should not be arrested, whatever may be the case on him, whatever may be the criminal cases against him, one should not be arrested is the jurisprudence. That is the international law. You must have read uh, Kalpana Karnaviram's article much earlier when he was arrested. In fact, uh, she has sent as an article as a petition also to Supreme Court, but Supreme Court did not take it. Till now. <coughs> this is a bad president. And another pres bad president only recently when Telangana Democratic Forum this, uh, meeting was to be held against the Green Hunt Corporation, the war on the people, the third phase in the Nakaranya, both of us were speakers there, in fact. And the court says, the High Court says, that uh, both of them should not speak there. Who is to speak in a meeting? meeting who should not be speaking uh, to, to, to speak in a meeting? Now the court decides. Police deciding is one thing. Gaudaji Narayan Rao was sent out from Varangal city when he was 16 years old. He was exiled by the government. One can understand that. But the court says that one should speak and one should not speak. It gives a list of five speakers that they can speak. And it bans other people, particularly myself and Sai Baba were banned not to speak in that meeting. This 
bad precedent, particularly from judiciary. And I need not say today's, uh, I'm sorry to say, media and judiciary. Judiciary, the third part of the democracy, and media, the fourth pillar of the democracy, how today have become so much corrupt and so much bankrupt with ideas that I think uh, that is the beginning of Pasta. And this is because of the corporatization. The whole media is today particularly thank to God that uh, regional languages are not the uh, media is not maintained by the corporate sector but where English if you see the whole English media particularly Times of India you know not only just maintained by a corporate sector. The whole English media is done by corporate sector and the whole the government is the agent of the corporate sector today. I need not say that all the political parties Whatever may be the name, the Congress, BJP, TDP, TRS, whatever may be the name, all the political parties are just compadres of, just agents of the, either of the companies. Either Adani, or Ambani, or Tata, Yassar, Vedanta, I need not say about Vedanta. Most notorious company, as you must have, you must be seeing that about Jaipur Literary Festival, what notorious role this uh, Vedanta is playing, sponsoring, the Jaipur Literary Festival, not only in Jaipur, but also in London. Where the Ayubasi, Dalit, Muslim, Bhagavan writers are boycotting the Jaipur and Sajjanandan also, on the request of the Dalits and Ayubasi, says, refused to go as a speaker to that meeting. You must have heard about that. So that's, that's, that, that is the role of the companies today, that is the role of the corporate sector today, worldwide. You know Vedanta has its, its own interest in Zambia, Australia, Goa, Chhattisgarh, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, Rajasthan, Telangana, whatever the state you mention, the whole state's governments are being run by the companies like Vedanta, SR and such other companies. Nothing else. The simple language is today's, the media is controlled by these companies, even I think the judiciary also. The high level judges are being given training by the World Bank, how to serve the corporate sector in such a bad condition. That you know, right from the East India Company days, the Brahminical, feudal Brahminical philosophy is serving as a superstructure to this imperialist process. And today it has come to power also. It has started from at the time of the Babri Masjid the demolition. Now it has surfaced. It has dipped the iceberg then, but today it has surfaced in the name of Modi, who is responsible for killing 3,000 Muslims in Gujarat, now has become Prime Minister, Ache Din Ayaga, Make in India, and you see what is happening. He is serving as a comparator to the companies with ideological support to it at the superstructure level, the Hindutva, the killing of the people, the writers, Akra, all that. I need not go into those details. In this situation, this is nothing but, you may not be compare it with the classical fascism of Germany days, Germany and Italy days, but it is certainly a fascist state with the Hindutva serving, the Brahminical Hindutva serving the company, the imperialism. In such a situation, Sai Baba faced all the ordeals in jail and he has come to speak to you, he will interact with you with this small interaction. Thank you very much. Autobiography. Jain Sai Baba has translated in uh, Malupu publisher last time he spoke here. Uh, when Satnam died, of course, uh, the tragedy has committed suicide. And his book, Jangal Lama, most popular book, was published by the Malupu publishers. Of course, they also have published uh, Walking with Comrades by Arundhati Rai, both English and Telugu. And now they are publishing this book. Shortly it will come out. And uh, Sai Baba has translated that book. Besides many other writings, he has translated this book in his jail. It's a great occasion for me to be here in Hyderabad. And among the people who supported me all in the last two years, it's a great uh, <laughs> movement, mo moment for me. 
three days ago when I came here, first time after two years, after four years in fact, and two years of almost uh, two years of uh, day life, there is a sense uh, uh, that I experienced through that uh, in my own land I am an outsider. Particularly, uh, this feeling as uh, kind of prevailing in my mind when I went to Varangal with a great expectation uh, to be part of the people uh, in the rally uh, against the Operation Green Hand. Uh, what depressed me was uh, the order of the High Court <laughs> banning a few people not to speak there. <laughs> and this is the first time also to see, particularly to ban certain voices by, by High Court. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, this has been working on my mind very heavily. One of the reasons also uh, why I wanted to come to Varangal was that uh, I could meet a number of friends and comrades and also I wanted to hear Vivi there. Since my college days, university days, it was uh, kind of, uh, you know, like I habituated that I wanted, I always wanted to hear Vivi speaking. And I was expecting that uh, I would have an opportunity more than anything like I wanted to speak against Operation Agreement in Varangal, I wanted to listen to him. I went there, I was not very unhappy that I was not allowed to speak, it was fine for me because uh, I got habituated with this, uh, uh, this thing that I, my uh, voice is being strangled for uh, uh, two years. I was not very much uh, so expecting that I wanted to speak but I wanted to listen to him. But to my surprise when the order came that he should not speak from the dais. A person comes from the same place and is uh, he's the person who is uh, I mean, whose voice for more than half a century is heard by the people and it is like I mean, it was a kind of emotionally I was upset. How could a person who is speaking for more than half a century should be no should not be allowed to speak? And then you can see that uh, when I was arrested, 9th May 2014, the police who arrested me by kidnapping me, they said that uh, you, we are arresting you because we don't want you to speak. We want you to shut your mouth. That's why we are arresting you. This was the, the, the officer who arrested me told me the first words are this, that you should not speak. We want you to shut your mouth. That's why we are arresting. And then, after exactly after one year, I come here. Two years, I come here, and uh, I could see, I could not digest this. Professor Rogopal, uh, in, in our annual meeting two days ago, he started with saying that, uh, how do I understand this? A person whom I wanted to listen all the time since 70s, that's what Professor Aragopal was saying, was not allowed to speak and I was allowed to speak. Like Professor Aragopal was allowed to speak, but Varvaro was not allowed to speak. What was this? And he said that, you know, like, uh, is it an insult to me or that uh, I, I mean, uh, by giving a chance to me to speak, there, uh, is the High Court or the State Government is insulting me? that you can speak but nobody will care about if you speak. But if Varvaro speaks, everybody, we are very serious about it. I, and it is, <coughs> I mean, last two days it's heavily working on my mind. Like, how is it that it is possible that uh, all the crime that is the act, uh, me or Varvaro, uh, is that if you speak, there is a crime. And speaking is a crime now. You cannot speak. And I was told clearly that you should, I mean, we are arresting you because you are speaking against certain things which are uncomfortable for the government of India. So, 
And to, to start with, like, I mean, what's, what, what has been happening to me, and even, in fact, thousands of people who were in prisons, was the same thing, like, you know, you, the basic thing is that the, polit the political prisoners are being arrested for, precisely for the reason that they, they are speaking. The only crime that is, the political prisoners are doing is, they are speaking. You should not speak. That is the kind of a thing. It was not about only me. I understood, while being in the under cell, I was reflecting and what was the crime. And people who were speaking vocally against the atrocities on the people, and Adivasis, Dalis, they were the people who were, I mean, you could see that uh, just before me, who were released from the same under cell where I was kept, I just stepped in and a few people came out. One among them was uh, uh, a, a Dalit speaker, singer. Uh, <coughs> And uh, he was precisely arrested and kept for five, five years in the, in the same under cell, uh, Sudhir Dhawale, who was a singer and a speaker. And he just came out and has just entered into the, in, into the same cell he was kept before. He was a singer and he was a speaker. He was arrested and kept for five years. And uh, before that, uh, you could see that uh, for two years, uh, Dr. Vinayak sir was asked. What was his crime? He was speaking in a Salva's group. He went around the country with a report, with a large fact-finding team. He went in, inside Bastar and he brought out all the atrocities, recorded and documented atrocities of, in the name of uh, uh, Salva Judo. And with that report, he went around the country and spoke against Salva Judo. And he was arrested and kept in jail for two years. And Salva Jurum atrocities were replaced by Operation Green Hand. And in his place, I started collecting all the data and went around. And then uh, after uh, that, I was arrested the same way. It was the, the, the act of speaking became a criminal act in this country. Uh, coming back to uh, to my jail experiences. I had a great opportunity also. I mean, it was not all uh, the sad story and the torturous uh, life that I experienced through. I had a great opportunity to meet about 70 Adivasi boys from Chhattisgarh and Maharashtra, interior places. That was the greatest moment uh, I had enjoyed and uh, learned from them. Incidentally, uh, the Adivasi boys who were arrested much before me and languishing in under cell and some of them who were recognized as notorious uh, 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 Naxalites were kept in the under cell. Seven of them were selected out of 70. And uh, I was taken on the, on the, on the tenth night uh, in the middle of the night, I was taken to that prison. From Aheri, I was taken there after being produced before the magistrate. <laughs> and I was alone. I kept. I was taken directly the next morning to the under cell. And I was kept alone. Under cell is a small uh, cell uh, built by particularly by uh, Rajiv Gandhi for the purpose of keeping uh, terrorists of, from Punjab. Away from Punjab, they wanted to keep uh, in a uh, enclosed uh, prison cell. So they built it in the early 90s for the Punjab, the so-called Punjab militants. And uh, the moment I, I was taken, I was, the undercell itself was divided into four sections. One section, was vacated and I was kept alone on that section so that I could not even see a human face except the gods. The other side of the section I was kept, there was a high wall and after the wall the other section was there, these Adivasi boys were there. Somehow the Adivasi boys came to know that uh, 
a person called Sai Baba with 90% disability was lodged on the other side. So they sh started shouting my name, saying in Hindi, actually these Adivasi boys didn't know Hindi or any other language other than Gondi. But after coming to jail, they learned a bit of Hindi and they shouted, Sai Baba, hum idhar hai, aap, aap ke liye hum idhar hai. Aap daro mat, aap pake le nahi hai. Oh, uh, the voice was feebly coming from the high walls uh, the other, from the other side. I didn't know what to do. I was in my wheelchair. In the small cell, they uh, left me in the wheelchair there and locked it again. You see, like, if you to enter inside the under cell, one has to cross seven huge iron gates. After that, iron gates also, the small cell has its own uh, the iron bars and then there is a gate again there. They lock that gate as well. And so you could see that uh, I could not even come out of the wheelchair and then you, I had to, if I wanted to lie down I have to get onto the floor. I can't get onto the floor, you know. And if I get onto the floor I can't come back onto my wheelchair on my own unless two people help me too. The only thing that was coming was, which I didn't know that these Adivasi boys were shouting from the other day, other side. For three days I didn't know that who was shouting to uh, give me help. Three days I was there without food, without water, without going to the toilet. In the, in the under cell, in the small cell, I was just, was like that. And third day, very interestingly, the Adivasi boys climbed the wall, jumped over the other side. I didn't know about them. They never saw me. But after coming to the jail, some of them spent five years, three years already by then. Through newspapers, I, they came to know and uh, about me. And they knew through newspapers and some magazines which the language which they learned there itself in a few years in Hindi, they, 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 they learned that I was fighting against the Aparish to Greenland and I was, for the same reason I was kept there. And these boys were not politically organized uh, people or part of any member of any organization. But you could see the level of consciousness of those people, though the simple villagers, all of them were in early 20s, they were the farmers, are the sons of the farmers who cultivate, but the level of, you know, like a few years they learned the language, they learned the politics in jail. But the level of consciousness was very high by the time they were sent to, to the jail. So because they are coming from the land where political consciousness was very high, higher than all of us, I could experience the next two years with, uh, spending with them. In the cities, the universities, we spend uh, debating every day, but the level of consciousness I wondered. And they shouted. And the third day, they jumped over the wall. So, a few hours, they, everybody in the under cell will be just left out from their cells. The moment, the third, till the third day, they waited. And the third day in the morning, when the cell lockup was open, straight away, they jumped the wall, high wall. The high wall was nothing for them. In fact, they were saying that we can cross anything, any tree, any uh, hill. What is this high wall? <laughs> and uh, they jumped. Immediately, superintendent and all officials rushed to them. That the, some prisoners have jumped the wall of one section of the under cell and crossed over to the other section. It was like a very high dramatic with some 20 guards and all officers came with lattice. Then these three Adivasi boys who jumped out of seven, they stood their ground and said that you, either you shift us to help this man, for three days he did not eat, he did not drink a, a drop of water. We know through the gods that he is going to die. We will be here with him or you shift him to our section of the... Otherwise we will not come from you. For, from six o'clock morning to after 2 o'clock, the fight went on. They refused to move from there. 
I was locked. My lock, uh, my lock up was not open. They were sitting and uh, and standing before my cell, and they resisted this, that we will not leave this way. Then they opened the lock, and they allowed these three boys to come inside. And then they uh, carried me in on their own in their own hands and helped me to go to the toilet. This was the first three days that what happened. And then they brought the food. They uh, gave me a bath. After that, first time I ate from their hands. Then the evening, six o'clock, they fought. And I, they, they brought me from the cell outside. There is a small corridor, just only a corridor. And then from the lockup to the corridor, they brought me. And they refused and they said that he will not be locked up. If you are going to lock him up, they here, they will not be locked up and we are getting, uh, we will not get there. That was the kind of fight they gave. By evening they said that one of you can stay with him this in this thing, but tonight. Then they bargained for two. Uh, to carry him in our hands, we need two people. Then they allowed two people to stay with me for that night, third day night. And then, before they uh, locked up at 6 o'clock, these three boys just almost ran out of the, uh, the under cell, which is completely closed under cell. It's a uh, cement concrete one. Well, there's only one door where the heavy guards were there. But in a flash of a second, they ran out of it and they brought in a, a, a pot. It's a dilapidated pot without any uh, kind of, uh, uh, it is a broken pot. But somehow, how they found that, I don't know. They must have seen it somewhere. Outside lying, it was a thrown out pot and they brought it inside. In front of all officers, they could not, I mean, it was a surprise shock for them, what these people were doing. And then in a flash of a second, they brought it and then put it there. And then they asked me to lie down on that. that that's the, how uh, my life in Anda cell started. For the next two, next two years, except for the six months I was outside, these boys were with me. I mean, I was many times isolated from these boys, but there was a fight. Always the fight went on, and they refused to go back. I'll come to the story of this, uh, the, how these Adivasi boys fought for me. The first day when I entered the jail, at the entrance inside, there was a photo of Gandhi and there was a quotation. That quotation was saying that uh, the prisoners uh, should accept themselves as a sinners. And then uh, uh, it was like a Christian uh, concept but uh, it's come through Gandhi. Uh, the sinners would repent and then uh, the, through repentance uh, they will come out of the prison gates. This was the quotation that was there in Nagpur Central Jail uh, in the, in the, in the moment you enter there. And you, after you enter and he started living there, you will surprise to see the sinners, the Gandhi sinners. 85% of the people in Nagpur Central Prison were Dalits, Adivasis and minorities and some of the OBCs. These are the sinners. And 85% of them were arrested and kept for petty crimes. And petty crimes, most of those petty crimes were not even committed by them. Those were the sinners. And all those sinners, initially when I was taken inside, at 2.30 uh, in the night, I was kept in a, a place called, a barrack called Ad Adan, the entry point of the uh, prisoner's life. They asked me a question by 
three, three thirty or so, they all got up uh, about my name and what is the crime. I I was hesitant to say what was my crime. How do you how do these people understand what uh, when I say that I am uh, arrested as a uh, notorious Naxalite? I was hesitating, but then. One Muslim boy took out a newspaper and, and read it out about the news that I am going to be shifted to this place. Everything was already in the news. They knew everything. There was nothing for me to hide. In fact, or nothing to hesitate to speak. And from 3 o'clock to 8 o'clock, I spent that uh, time with them, speaking to them. And I realized that they were all Adivasis uh, and uh, our uh, Dalits are minorities. The war representation, you know, like in our university, uh, it was uh, only 2000 the reservation started implementing, uh, implementing uh, in Delhi University. Never implemented reservations till 2000. Uh, and there was no representation, not uh, even now there is not a single professor who comes from a Dalit or Adivasi community. The kind of representation that you can see in the university and in the, in the prison. So, wow, representation of these sections was there. I mean, as it is, there are people, 80% of these people are there, but uh, the, the 85% of them are. But uh, even if you take that 15% that uh, who I'm saying that the uh, others, who were, some of them were really could be criminals, they were also, they were also poor people. But, from the next day onwards, every guard in the jail, every jailer, and every uh, uh, the prisoner who, uh, who is the prison jobs, they were all told that they should never meet me, never try to speak me, to, uh, with me, because I was a notorious terrorist. Everybody was told by uh, the morning. They were trained not to see and all that. Then the curiosity increased. You know? There were 2,500 prisoners and everybody wants to see me. Everybody wants to talk to me now by evening the next day. <laughs> so, I mean, it became a, like uh, unrest in the prison. They, everybody wants to see. And then uh, my photograph was flashed on the TV screens for the next uh, few weeks, all the time, and everybody wants to speak, and then nobody can be uh, can enter, and I, neither could I go out of uh, the under cell. So now everybody, the next day by evening, I started getting <coughs> letters, secret letters from various barracks. We wanted to see, we wanted to see the letters are entering through number of people. I mean, some jailers themselves are bringing secretly. <laughs> And then uh, uh, guards were bringing this watchmen, uh, watchmen, and then uh, this all kinds of people who come to clean the toilets, to uh, those people who bring the food. They were everybody is coming and carrying a letter, secret letter, uh, that particular person, particular person wanted to see and talk to. So uh, I mean, it was very difficult for me, but at the same it was very, very exciting also the life there. Then you could see that uh, uh, before coming to uh, the prison, in fact, there was something happened which I could not believe with me. You know that I was uh, kidnapped virtually, uh, the, I mean uh, on the way I was stopped and kidnapped and taken to the airport. And from the airport I was taken to Nagpur. Uh, uh, Nagpur, and the moment I was brought out from the Nagpur uh, airport, I could see columns and columns of uh, 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 heavy guarded uh, uh, special security forces called uh, C-60. From Nagpur airport to Aheri, the interior place in uh, Gachiroli, there are 2,000 security forces were, uh, were arranged to take me from there. I mean, it was night, it started at around 8 o'clock, 
nobody was there to see even these forces. And but there were hundreds of vehicles. And I was taken in one vehicle and then there is a huge convoy of buses and different vehicles started moving. One of the entire roads were cordoned off. Perhaps even the most, I mean the so-called most notorious terrorist or even Bin Laden might not have been taken like this. I was there and then this, the entire column of uh, C-60 forces were moving. I was told by different officers who were taking places uh, in my car that uh, they were 2,000 forces. By the time I reached Chandrapur, the armed vehicles, you know the military armed vehicles were also seen and a little ahead the anti-landmine vehicles were there in my convoy. Uh, there were 20 anti-landmine vehicles which were brought uh, know, for uh, uh, exercises and uh, movements of the uh, these paramilitary forces in the interior areas of Gachurali district. They were all deployed on the road now and they were saying that they are for my security. I, understood, I could not understand what security <laughs> could they give me. Then it was a cinematic scene. I don't know if there is a film director in this uh, audience and uh, it would uh, sound very exaggerated scenario for you if I just describe this and it was moving the entire column of uh, the security forces were moving very slowly on the road you know and then over my head the helicopters were moving <laughs> And the helicopters belonging to, very interestingly, Indian uh, uh, Air Force and Russia and Israel. These are the helicopters. I know, I am not telling you uh, on my own this thing. In two years I learned about these helicopters also. Uh, helicopters, perhaps uh, nobody knows, but even the media has not written about. Helicopters from Russia and Israel are lying in, in, the, in Nagpur. They are, uh, they are in the part of the Operation uh, Green Hunt. And every day in the morning, the last two years, uh, or 18 months, I was there, more than 18 months, above the Andrasil also we could see the helicopters, always moving and hovering uh, above the Andrasil. It was not because of, they were not deployed again on the Andra cell, but uh, uh, you know that the central command uh, of the central India for coordinating the operational green hand is in Nagpur. It is not in Raipur, it is Nagpur. Uh, the, uh, everything is coordinated from Nagpur. And uh, highest number of helicopters are also kept there. And uh, you can see that the entire column of these forces in the middle of uh, that my car with uh, two I IPS officers sitting on both sides moving <laughs> towards Aheri and then uh, uh, these landmen, anti-landmen vehicles, armed uh, vehicles and then uh, above uh, the moving, uh, these helicopters moving, we reached by 3.30 to Aheri. That was the time when uh, entire uh, forces were deployed and five district SPs were coordinating that entire operation of uh, shifting Sai Baba in his wheelchair from Nagpur to Aheri. Apart from DIG or special operations and in the same manner after a day I was brought with the same forces moving again uh, back to Nagpur on uh, 10th night, 2.30 I was brought. Three guards in front of the central prison, high security prison, was standing when I was, uh, my vehicle was approaching the uh, guard, uh, the central prison. And uh, the three guards are the people who, they, are, they belong to the central prison with one weapon in their hand. 
and within flash of a second, you know, one after the other, other vehicles were uh, coming, entering into the premises of the uh, the the, uh, the jail, and this uh, uh, the jungle fatigue. Did you? Uh, C-60 forces are getting out of their vehicles. Seeing that, the jail guards, through their uh, uh, the, 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 the weapons, and ran away from the uh, main, main gate. They ran for their life. Perhaps they thought that the Naxalites or someone was attacking the jail or what. They could not see that. When the same guards, when they were deployed in Andasal, they were narrating what they felt and uh, later on after months. So I was brought inside. By the time I was brought inside the prison, I am coming back again to the main gate all the time of uh, the central prison, uh, my wheelchair was broken. <laughs> and my hand was broken already, left hand. They dragged me in high hairy with my left hand. Because, I mean, uh, the constables, they did it. <coughs> Very interestingly, there are two incidents. The people who dragged me with, uh, with out of law, I mean, these constables in Aheri, they are Adivasi uh, constables. I mean, why I never made a complaint when my hand was broken is the reason is this. I never revealed it to anyone, but uh, I, I have this opportunity to reveal it. These three constables were asked to shift me from vehicle in the Aheri police station and I reach to the lockup. These boys did not understand. They, with the, out of eagerness, they just uh, you know, took my hand and they dragged me out of the car and put me in the wheelchair. And there is no ramp or anything to take the wheelchair. There was uh, uneven ground. It was very difficult to... There the wheelchair broke. Uh, got broken and then uh, they were trying to lift me. In that process my hand was stretched, over stretched and the nerves got damaged and then uh, slowly next uh, nine months uh, muscles got damaged. But these people never did this with any intention to arm me. Who is responsible for this? I mean, this, uh, can I say that these people, I mean, they, they allowed me they wanted to take care of me, they wanted to lift me. In that process, they did a mistake. So I never discussed this with anyone so far, but I wanted to share that with you. And then, uh, uh, then I was taken to the lockup. That night, these boys, that got, uh, the Adivasi boys who were the constables who were part of the C60, they were very I mean, uh, worried about that, what happened to Sai Baba's house. I mean, their duty was over, but still they came back to see and worried and they wanted to uh, you know, uh, see uh, what they could do and all that. I refused to take food because there was no toilet. Uh, the officers came with the food and they told me that you take the food. Yes, I will take the food, but you provide me with the toilet. No, I have to go to urinals, I have to go to uh, for uh, littering. Without that, Already uh, potatoes are over, you, uh, how can I eat? They said, no, there is no facility of this. We can't. Then I, I refused to eat. But these Adivasi boys who uh, dragged uh, this and after the officers left, they used to bring mangoes, this and that, and they tried to use tea, cigarette and all that. They worried, they are worried. I mean, of course, I met them even after two years or so, when I was about to come out again. Uh, I will tell you about this Adivasi constable, the story a little bit later on. I will come back again. Uh, I mean, there is I mean, every mo moment, there is some moments of an anxiety, excitement, there is a kind of interest in human relations within the custody, within the four walls, and within this highly repressive atmosphere as well. Uh, so, in the well, after I moved into the prison and all these incidents that were happening, by that time I could see that the entire prison was infested with uh, intelligence people. Intelligence officers from Hyderabad, of course Delhi, from Nagpur, Maharashtra, everywhere. They were there all the days and months and years that I was there, always 
and uh, they were given only duty that what should I mean whatever I was doing they should report. Particularly, there was a heavy pressure on the jail officers. At that time, interestingly, all the jail officers were Dalits or Adivasis. And uh, they don't trust them. They, the state don't trust the Adivasis and uh, 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 Dalits who were jail officers at that time. So, somehow they feel that somewhere or the other they have a sympathetic uh, feeling towards me. That's why they were actually not me more than me uh, and me. The vigilance was there of the jail officers. I mean, uh, after a few days, uh, uh, Vivek and uh, others, uh, Justice Kosle Party, they came to meet me in uh, jail. And uh, I, uh, finally, they, were, they allowed me to meet uh, Vivek in jail. Uh, in the superintendent's office. That officer at that time was a Dalit. <laughs> you could see that, you know that. And he was, he was suspended, not because, I mean, not because of that arrangement, but he felt that was also uh, the reason. He was suspended later on. And he is still not reinstated. <laughs> uh, that the entire jail was a kind of a concentration camp, where only uh, the, 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 the sharp eyes of the intelligence people were always there observing what's, uh, what I was doing. But uh, the struggle for the, of the Adivasi boys went on. The, the demand was that Saibaba should be shifted to the wing of the under cell where all the Adivasi boys under the Naxalite uh, category or place. Uh, and they said that uh, sending two people now and then to help him is not the answer. You shift him to the wing where we are living. So we can take turns and take care of him. That was the demand they And the jail officers uh, were saying that we wanted to shift him that uh, from Mumbai we have orders that we should push him. So it went on for 20 days next. And uh, how was I living? Uh, whenever the lockups were opened, these Adivasi boys, they jumped over the wall, high wall, come help me. Uh, take my, I mean, to, have to take my bath, to give me food and all that. Uh, then they go back. And then next time when it is open, then again they come and jump and come. And the guards also, when the officers were not there, the guards also uh, ignore this. You know, they, they don't know that uh, these people are jumping the wall. Uh, I mean, even they, even in front of them it happens. Some guards, you know, like uh, they ignore and say that, no, we don't know anything about it. It went on for 20 days. The struggle was that at evening, every day evening, 6 o'clock, the lockup, the lockup is there, the lock, uh, will be locked up. Everybody should be locked up. Out of 24 hours, even in the undercell after 7 gates inside, morning 6 to 12 o'clock, we were allowed to come out of the lockup in the prison. That is a small corridor only. Going into out of the lockup means only the small corridor in front of your uh, this thing uh, uh, lockup. Even that is a great thing for us. You know, coming out of the lockup is like you, know, you can feel like you are uh, you have freedom. Uh, every evening, again, uh, twelve o'clock to three o'clock you are locked up, and you, uh, three to six o'clock again you are uh, out of the lockup. Those uh, morning nine uh, six hours, evening three hours, nine hours, you can, but you cannot move from one wing to the other, or you can't talk. Only if the people are there in the same wing, you can talk during those uh, nine hours. But nine hours are not nine hours, officially nine hours. Uh, most of the days, it will, it will turn out to be two hours or three hours, because there are many other rules also. That uh, if there is a visiting officer from outside prison, uh, that day lockup will not be open, even for those hours. Or if there is a festival day or a holiday, uh, this will not be open, even those hours. Are. 
that kind of restrictions were there. So for 20 days, continuously, next 20 days, the struggle is that at evening 6 o'clock, all the Adivasi boys on the other wing, they say that we will not get locked up, we will, they will stand in the car. Line. Unless you shift cyber war to our wing, we will not get locked. But now the jail, for the jail officers, it's a big thing. 6 o'clock you have to show on the records that everybody is locked up. Otherwise it's a, it's a big uh, crime war against the officers. So it is, every day all the officers with ladies they used to come to use all their force, whatever that is possible to uh, uh, push them into lockup and lock, uh, lock them up. But these Adivasi boys they you know, used to uh, hold each other's hand and uh, they never used to allow these people to be forcefully locked up. And it went, goes on till 7 o'clock and then you have crossed your limit. 6 o'clock lockup is not, uh, did not happen, that is a big thing. And you, you could not record the 6 o'clock lockdown. I was 20 days. After 20 days, they shifted me to the wing where I was, where the Adivasi boys, seven Adivasi boys were there. Then the struggle started for the toilet, for making the wheelchair accessible. We want a wheelchair, wheelchair is broken. It took four months to get a wheelchair. That too, my wife has to bring it from Delhi. Till then, the wheelchair was not there. I was crawling, and Adivasi, Adivasi boys have to carry me. And then uh, this hand, which uh, was uh, uh, the nerve system, was got disturbed. It was extreme pain, and then there was no medicine. It went on like that. And then the jail authorities wanted to shift me out to the hospital, but from higher ups, there was pressure that I should not be shifted to hospital. It went on like that. But meanwhile, with the pain and everything, we were, we found different ways of communicating with general barracks, our 2500 prisoners, somewhere or the other. There are mechanisms developed by them or by me, by all the verses that, you know, you may find ways out to communicate. And then, after two months, the communications established then every issue that was happening outside the jail in the world, we used to also do some programs in jail. From under cell, there were programs. When a, when a Dalit massacre happened, we observed hunger strike for a day. When some encounter killing happened, we did this. Or when the Bhagat Singh uh, martyrdom day came, entire jail became a uh, kind of a program without moving, you know, out of Andasil also, the program took place, like that. You, with that kind of heavy repression also, uh, because, this was possible because, majority, overwhelming majority of the people in that jail, I suppose in every jail, uh, is Dalit, Adivasi and minorities. And they have such creativity, they know how, how, uh, how to live in hard conditions in their life itself, in their lives. They can adjust to any kind of circumstances, jail is nothing for them because they had seen worse conditions in their lives and they lived with those worst conditions. And then even within that you know, four walls of jail, they know how to live. I mean, not regretting their lives of, uh, in jail and uh, not crying all the time that they were unnecessarily and uh, illegally they were kept under the custody without any crime. They know how to celebrate life, perhaps. And I learned from them. So, I uh, communicating through them, you know, like, uh, I know that uh, there is nothing in the jail hospital, not even a thermometer was there. But jail hospital is one point where we could meet. From different barracks, people also wanted, uh, they will write letters, but particular time we will come to the hospital. Three days before you have to write a letter to the superintendent, we wanted to go to the hospital. The jail hospital, they will write and plan it. And they asked me to write a letter to the superintendent for the same time and same day to come to the uh, jail hospital and then there is occasion to meet and then uh, 
you will be in the queue to wait for the doctor to see and during that time all the queues you communicate talk hug your, each other that was that i mean that is the way in which you can very interesting another uh, uh, modern technology like uh, video conferencing video conferencing is a modern technology the government wants uh, to use that for the rights of the prisoners it turned out to be against the rights of the prisoners you know like what happens is that uh, you are not produced in the court you are produced to video conference to the court and in uh, uh, I mean, you are not taken out of the prison. You can't see what the, uh, the outside world is. Within the four walls of the uh, prison, you are confined completely. And attending a court date through video conference means a clerk will come on the video screen and says that the judge has given you this date. Next date is this. That is the attending the court. Neither you have any opportunity to uh, talk to the judge now you have any possibility of knowing what is happening in your case and uh, uh, you can't have a word with your lawyer nothing is known only date will be given and most of this day days also the date is also not given they will say that the, the date will be given later on that is a video conferencing and then that is the great technology that is being used for the rights of the prisoners that is being interpreted and the Honorable Supreme Court accepted that and formulated some guidelines for uh, attendance of uh, prisoners through the court. So, uh, when I went to the Nagpur prison, the major issue was the video conferencing. Every prisoner was uh, no, complaining that we don't want to attend the court through video conference. Because they don't know anything what's happening in their case. The Supreme Court guidelines is that uh, to avoid and to save money for the government, they should not be, I mean, escort need not be given, vehicles need not be arranged. The great technology of video conference is there. They can uh, attend the court through the video conference. Supreme Court has, Honorable Supreme Court has given the guidelines. But Supreme Court guidelines has also said one thing. Once your trial starts, trial should happen in the open court and the prisoner should be presented in the open court. That is there in the guidelines. But in Nagpur, that is not followed. Even you were, trial happens from within the four walls of the prison. And what is the trial? Does it happen in the video conference? <coughs> the trial happens in the court. The video conference room is separate and you are told that uh, uh, the next date. But that still is interpreted as that the, the, the prisoner is presented in the court. Uh, and the trial uh, witnesses were produced and everything is happening in the in a transparent manner in the open court. We will not know. So first 18 months I was also not taken, uh, except once, not taken to the court. Uh, I was asked to attend the court through video conference. The trial did not start. After three months, only once I was taken to Ahiri Magistrate Court from the jail. Again, 2,000 forces and uh, hundreds of officers, land, anti-landman vehicles, everything, scene is repeated. The only one time I was taken from jail to the court, to Haiheri Magistrate Court, the entire cell. The only difference now is, uh, there are 10 vehicles of media people also. Because in the morning, 10 o'clock I was taken out, no, no, no morning, 8 o'clock I was taken out. 10 vehicles of video, this media people, that is even uh, embedded media people, uh, the police media people in the hands of the police, embedded people, they were also there. And I was taken in a very ceremonious way from the court to the magistrate, and the magistrate gave me my charge sheet and sent me back. So I objected to the magistrate that the charge sheet is in uh, Marathi, I can't understand. And I gave, and he said that no, I can't help. Uh, in Maharashtra, we only gave you in Marathi. Then I gave a letter, written letter, and then he said that you know, uh, you appoint a translator for yourself. And I said I am in prison. How can I appoint a translator for myself? He said you know, like uh, you learn Marathi in jail. So <laughs> that is the magistrate. Hmm? 
And uh, the same magistrate, when first time I was, uh, 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 I was presented, I spoke to him. My lawyer was not there, no one was there. I spoke to them that uh, for already 50 hours by then, I could not go to the toilet, I was in the lockup, I could not eat anything, I was, uh, no, I was bleeding already from my ears. My BP was recorded by the doctor as a 170 by uh, 110. Uh, this is the medical condition, I was bleeding, you can see my ble bleeding from my nose and the ears. And he said, oh, this is very bad. Uh, I will write in the, uh, uh, the warrant uh, uh, to the prison that you will be taken care of. And then of course I also asked for two people should be there in the prison to help me and I should need medical uh, this thing. I need a cot or a table to lie down from my wheelchair, this all. Oh, well, I have written everything. Now, without any problem, you can go. Uh, everything will be arranged there. First, you will be taken uh, to med for medical care. Everything I have written now, you see. To my surprise, that magistrate had written nothing. When the police brought me to the first day to the jail, I mean the warrant, there was not a single word. He lied, the magistrate, that he has written everything that I wanted and he recorded everything and the health condition and all. Nothing was written. The same magistrate, in my case, three Adivasis were also arrested. And he recorded, without they being produced in the court, without asking them or talking to them, <laughs> those people, Adivasi people, in, the, in my case, the magistrate recorded their uh, uh, I mean, court statement, confessing that they have uh, confessed their crime. Their long story, uh, the story of uh, what uh, in my in our case there's a, there is a person uh, an enigmatic person is given in our case that uh, uh, the, the, the central point of the case is that there is a woman in the forest called Narmadatta and Sai Baba was communicating through some students and through some Adivasi boys with that woman Narmadatta. Hmm? And then uh, there is a long story given, magistrate has given a story that this Adivasi boys narrated it as a confession. That was filed in the court. So that was the sole evidence is that, that there is a woman called Naxalite, Naxalite leader woman called Narmada. And she gave all this, I mean, uh, they, they gave, uh, uh, established a channel through the hands of these three Adivasi boys to Delhi. It's a very fantastic story. I mean, maybe uh, people who read uh, fantasies may also really uh, get surprised to see that this is a greater fantasy than anything else because uh, in the narration of the charge sheet, you could see uh, how Narmadaka looks like, what is her complexion, what is her beauty, everything comes through. You know, like you can see that uh, uh, Narmadaka has what kind of voice she has. I, I'm, I also know, like, dreamt of Narmadaka all these two years in my under cell. How she would look like, and then, uh, and if I uh, happen to meet her, what, to, what, should, what can I so, speak to her? And what should it be like? Uh, and these Adivasi boys, also three boys who were there in the prison, they were also wondering because these Adivasi boys, they, according to the police story, I mean, it is not like the Andhra Pradesh police stories of uh, uh, encounter the same words the same vocabulary and all that. This must have been scripted by some very gifted person, the story. Uh, it was a story of even describing the forest where these three Adivasi boys was met by this Radhamadaka and uh, how what instructions she gave. And uh, first time in the jail when I met these three Adivasi boys as my co-accused, when I read out the story uh, after it was translated into English, sorry, I'm taking so, such a long time, I will uh, wrap up with uh, a few things. Uh, uh, they are also surprised. I mean, uh, they were also very creative people, but uh, they were also surprised. Like, we were all dreaming together as kind of a figure of Narmadaka all these two years. And the same magistrate, you can see that, you know, like, uh, he wrote this, uh, the police story as it is. 
the same story is repeated in our chart sheet, which is a ten, I mean, a thousand page long. So four or five times the story repeats, and the same story is coming out of the mouth of these Adivasi boys, which never came from Adivasi. They were both boys, but the magistrate himself uh, repeated the story. And when uh, uh, my lawyer finally, uh, in, in the month of March, when he interrogated the magistrate, uh, the magistrate forgot the story. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, very interestingly, and uh, uh, the, the public prosecutor has to supply the story, the magistrate to repeat. And then, uh, 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 very creatively, our lawyer uh, asked certain questions whether they were produced. I mean, the people who were never produced in the court, they were given a confession before the magistrate in the court. That is the kind of case that you can see. Eh? I mean, if you can see the all other parts of the story of this case, it's I mean, it runs like a kind of uh, you know, uh, Hollywood uh, crime thriller. Uh, but without going that, I just wanted to a few things. Uh, maybe we can interact uh, later on. Uh, under the same between the court, jail, and hospitals, the three institutions of the state. Nine months they took to the prison to build a western style uh, 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 toilet in my small cell. But it started after three months. The construction started after three months. Even before the construction started, every time the bail application was, done, uh, uh, was filed, they lied saying that there was a western style toilet already constructed in his uh, prison cell and then uh, a wheelchair is provided, uh, latest modern uh, medical facilities are given to him, everything is like, from the lower court to the supreme court, everything is like. And so blatant the lies were that then the western style toilet built nine, after nine months never worked also, even till today it never worked. I mean, it was built in such a way that it would never work. And second time, when I was sent to prison, I was not even taken to the prison hospital. But they said that they were taken to a private hospital, to the Supreme Court, they said. Such kind of. And when after nine months, when I was taken to the government medical college hospital, 16 armed guards with AK-47s, they used to enter along with me into the room where the doctor was to treat me. And with a pointed gun uh, against the, I mean, uh, my head and the doctor, the doctor has to check me. I mean, I didn't understand, I mean, I didn't even read this kind of a story which happened to me. And then uh, all the doctors, others were, uh, uh, I mean, uh, taken away from that vacated. I mean, it's a general OPD where all the general people should be treated and it's vacated, you know, like the entire wing is vacated to take me to the hospital. The doctor is so terrorized that he his hand shakes when he takes this stethoscope and that kind of situation. And after that, the intelligence officer comes and takes that you have to write only this much. But very interestingly, Again, you can see Nagpur, it is Nagpur, despite the headquarters of RSS, there is a Dalit movement also. First doctor, a Dalit doctor, protested this. He shouted at the officers, intelligence officers in front of me and not a gun in the sight, I will not check him. He shouted. And then, by then, already 10 doctors examined. He referred to and he said that every report is wrong. I want everything to be specially done again. I, w I will not. He is not known to me, he is not known to anyone. <laughs> but he took such a daring step. And then uh, this uh, intelligence officer said that no, DAG is, uh, uh, is looking after this case, sir. Who is DAG? He said that. I will not. Even the Home Minister comes, I will not accept this. Every test has to be done again, he said. That. And then I will supervise every test. Everything has to, repeat, to be repeated. And you see, first uh, one month they took me, 
the what is the what what was there in the medical reports and the next uh, one month what what was there the entire thing is completely changing because now this doctor on his own is checking everything and then one after the other all the the health problems that I got accumulated nine over nine months came out and that report went to the uh, high court the chief justice based on which he immediately asked that within 24 hours he should be admitted in the house. And you see like several times, 29 times I was taken to the medical college after the uh, lower court order and they, after that uh, uh, high court entered into the house. Every time you know like between the court, hospital and the, uh, the jail, my life was entangled into the three institutions of highly oppressive institutions using their mighty force. But uh, in fact, you know, like uh, because of the campaign outside and the voices, even I got this kind of attention. But uh, what's happening to thousands of Adivasi prisoners, uh, prisoners all over the different states? We can't even hear of what's happening in Chhattisgarh prisons or Jharkhand prisons, even in Maharashtra. Uh, the, for each Adivasi prison also there is a uh, lawyer because of uh, the civil rights movement in Maharashtra that this was possible history uh, they are looked after but uh, there is not even a lawyer in other uh, states what I felt was that uh, uh, I mean there is a long story if we can say that every day was a eventful day because of the protests of the prisoners in my support. Just to see like, uh, I mean a few things. If I write one sentence in Telugu, they will object. Uh, how do they object? I mean, I, I was in my cell, I could write whatever I wanted to. But uh, every now and then, intelligence team will come and raid my cell. And if, I, if, if there is anything written in Telugu or English, they will take away that. Even English, but English papers they will return if they feel that there is nothing harmful they find according to them. But Telugu, uh, if I write a line also there, and particularly whenever I wrote letters to VV, uh, I wrote several letters. They, they never reached. I, I think two letters reached. And whenever he wrote, I I reached after 30 days. I I also got only two letters from him. I don't know how many letters he wrote. We never met so far uh, to discuss the thing. Particularly, if I write a letter, every day one intelligence officer will come with that letter and ask me to read it out. The next day, we, another officer will come with the same letter. It is a big harassment if I write a letter. Now, I did not write him in Telugu. I wrote him in English only. But even then, I took my wife or my child or my mother to write a letter. I have to write only in English. Of course, my, it's, there's no problem if I write in, to my daughter in English. But my wife wants in Tilum, they will never allow. They said, okay. But particularly if I write a letter to Vivi for the next one month, every day I will, I will have to confront with an intelligence officer. And finally, that will not reach. During such a situation, when I faced with such a situation, I thought that I should translate um, uh, in Gugi was young, it was born. Incidentally, Vasanta brought uh, a copy of uh, In Gugi's uh, two volumes of his biography. And uh, the last time before my arrest, when I visited uh, US, on the invitation of uh, Black uh, uh, Panthers movement leaders, who were Black Panthers in the 70s, and uh, they invited me to the university. There are more, uh, some of them were professors. They invited me for some lectures there. Uh, Ingugi could, uh, could not come to meet me and I could not go to meet him. Yeah, it's uh, you know, like the other side of the US. He was there. And he signed and sent a copy to me through a friend who was coming from San, Fra San Francisco to Atlanta. And I brought, and uh, uh, my Vasanta brought a copy to me to jail. That is another long story. To get a book inside the jail was uh, again a long struggle. But this copy came, and then I nurtured a desire that I should translate this. And particularly in a context that I am not allowed 
and every now and then my cell is raided by the intelligence officers in the middle of the night. Uh, like my house was raided before my uh, three months before my arrest. Even constantly every week there was a raid on my cell by the intelligence. So in such circumstances I decided to translate and then for about 15 years I did not write anything in Telugu. But I wanted to write in Telugu that book because the struggle of Ingugi in that book for education, to get education. That struggle was a kind of a, a magnificent struggle. All that struggle that was described was one parallel struggle happening in the hills against the British and the ruling classes who allied with the British. That is Mao Mao Armed Rebellion, where his young, elder brother was also the lead, uh, one of the leaders. Outside that area of the struggle, in the cities, the great, another great struggle, parallel struggle was going on for these Adivasi boys. They were Adivasi, Ngugi and all the Africans for education. Education to go to school was a big struggle. That struggle, the two, two parallel struggles were described in a wonderful manner and I identified myself for my own education, the struggle I had in my childhood. I had, you know, I thought that everybody should read this book and then uh, the only thing that I can do is to translate in Telugu where the circumstances in uh, Telugu speaking land uh, is very similar so you could, uh, people can read. I wanted to translate. Now the circumstances is that, you know, I can't keep a line in Telugu there. So, uh, but I, with great this thing, uh, enthusiasm, I started with the pain I could not sit and all that, but with that I started. Every page I finished translating and that page will be carried away from my cell immediately and kept in different cells hidden. That was the arrangement. In the under cell, who are they? Adivasis, Dalis, or the Muslim terrorists. All are in my favor. All are ready to help. So the each page will be carried away and hidden in different cells because the raid will happen in my cell and not other cells. So after two, three pages are translated and somebody among anyone out of 29 people in different cells of the under cell, whoever gets the opportunity to go to high court, attorneys, he will carry that page or three pages, keeping that in their underwear. You know, you are not able, uh, allowed to carry out anything from the prison. And they will go and give it to their lawyer, and their lawyer either will post it to some address or pass it on to my lawyer. This was the arrangement. And for the next three months, I translated and every page safely reached outside by all these prisoners. And when the prisoners, no prisoner was getting an opportunity to go and take this, the jail guards will carry the papers outside secretly. That's how each page came out of the jail. I will not take much time. There are many stories to tell about this. And of course, uh, so far, uh, in, the, in the campaign for my release and defense, uh, there are many stories which are about my suffering. And it, lies, it looks like a very tragic uh, uh, this thing. But the whole story is not a very such a sad story because the kind of people I had the opportunity to spend with. Though, so many restrictions were there, not even allowed to speak, standing orders were there that I was not allowed to speak with next person. Even then, I had such an eventful life in the world. I forgot my, uh, no, uh, the diseases, the problems I faced uh, with the suffering and the pain. I lived with them. And I, I mean, uh, eventful uh, days we had, and uh, also the uh, number of struggles we had in, within the prison. And uh, finally, one uh, one last thing I would just uh, tell you in a few days this thing. Every prisoner, by the second time I was sent back to the prisoner, decided that we will not attend the video conference. That became a kind of a, a civil war within the prison. And every prisoner refusing to attend the video conference, 
push the courts in Maharashtra into crisis, the government into crisis, the jail into crisis, the intelligence into crisis. Such was the situation when they decided that if Sai Baba is uh, taken to the court, Sai Baba will not raise this issue so others will forget and then others will win. That's how they produced me in the second phase, last phase in March, only one month, all the witnesses in my case were completed because the Supreme Court ordered that the main witnesses should be completed within the month, from March 4th to March, uh, April 4th. And initially the government said that he cannot be taken because there is security problems, uh, he cannot be produced before the court. And uh, the Supreme Court, that's why they said that you take him out of the jail and keep him in a uh, stay in a guest house. They said, no, we can't keep, there are security problems, we cannot keep him. The only reason which was not stated publicly by the government, as the central government or state government, not even declared or informed the Supreme Court was that, that is because of the struggle. This is that the, uh, we will not attend and I refuse to attend and all others are refused to attend in the court through video conference. Then they started taking me straight away without missing on a single day, every court date I was taken directly because of that. Not only that, all Adivasi boys started, they started taking them to the court. And they did not state why they were refusing for years to take them to the court. Now why they are taking, it was not stated, but they started taking everyone to the court. So, uh, this is in short, so many things are there, but uh, uh, of course we will have an opportunity sometime to talk about all this. And what they told me, how they suffered, and hearing with Sang Baba, I feel it is only 1% during the period of a king. And this is our democracy. Are we living in a democracy or a fascist government? That we have to decide. But when he has come out without any condition, that is bail from Supreme Court, he went to his college, the Ramlal College, the Delhi University Constitute College, and gave a letter to the principal that he will join the duty. And it's normal that he should be joined for that. And the governing council met. Ruta was fighting for him, the defense committee was fighting for him. You know Professor Hargopal is the chairman of the defense committee. In which uh, Arundhati Rai, Arun Tertomde, and many other eminent people are there in the defense committee. The defense committee, Ruta, the University Teachers Association, Nanita Naran, all these people are fighting with him. And on the day then the governing council met to decide about his joining, Eight outsiders, none of them were the students. They came out with the placards that Sai Baba is a Maoist and he should not be giant. And you know, they raided on these people who went there. And of course, since he was uh, their colleague, the teachers were offering a key to Sai Baba. And uh, they have pounced upon these people and the tree has fallen on his body and uh, his skin was burnt. And these eight outsiders, gooms, ruffians, entered into the governing council meeting and gave a letter that he should not be giant. This is kind of, he was telling that the Mauma moment in the uh, forest and the struggle of the Adivasis and that is outside for the education. The same thing is happening today. You can see the green hunt operation in the forest, the east and central India, and the struggle of the Dalit and Adivasi Muslim students in the universities. The same green hunt operation at the superstructure level and at the ground level. So these eight outsiders could influence the governing council of that college and they send a letter to him that unless we call, you should not come to college, it will become a law and problem. A teacher going to his college to teach his students will become a law and problem today. These are the conditions we are living in. And I think the second phase of struggle should be 
to see that Sai Baba is reinstated. And I think those who have supported him all these days, these two years, will support him to see that he joined in his college and can teach. With these words, I can ask our. Uh, uh, can give 10 more words? No? Uh, 10 or 15 minutes till 7 30 maximum. Everybody can ask questions. In fact, uh, I just want to say one uh, thing. Uh, I actually wanted to separately meet people to thank all, uh, all the people who uh, raised their voices and stood by me while I was being in prison. Uh, maybe some other day I will formally wanted to meet and thank everyone, but uh, I may not be able to meet all of you again. So I, uh, I wanted to thank everyone. Uh, I mean, uh, supporting me and raising voice for, uh, for my release was not actually raising voice against, uh, against my, I mean, for my release. It is for, I think, all the uh, political prisoners. I felt that the voices that raised across the country and the uh, outside for my release was not for me, it was for all the political prisoners. I was not actually, I never been an individual, my name is only a name, but I am one among the people who are now uh, behind the bars. And then uh, actually, uh, I felt also the content of the campaign for my release was like the campaign for all, uh, for the release of all the political prisoners. And uh, uh, I mean, I'm not individually actually thanking all of you. It is part of uh, all of us uh, to work and uh, uh, work for the release of all the political prisoners. Particularly, you can see that, you know, today, uh, the number of Adivasis and Dalits who are behind the prison for political reasons. These people are not for any personal reasons they were uh, arrested for political for their political beliefs or political acts they were arrested and kept behind the bars. And actually, uh, if I can be released uh, with a campaign like this, why can't we release every single political prisoner with a campaign uh, being stepped up? It is true and the only way I could understand is that even the courts are responding if the voices are there. If the voices are not raised, the courts also don't respond. So today, my release should actually uh, give a way for all of us to raise our voices in a consolidated way to release all the political prisoners. So I, in fact, I, I felt that the campaign already was for every political prisoner, not only for me. And now all of us should raise our voices across the country that uh, to raise every political prisoner. Yes. One thing that uh, really, I mean, uh, you would have noticed, I mean, throughout uh, during your conversation, you were trying to make light of some of the experiences that you went through. I think that is one coping mechanism that you had. But one interesting thing is that very few people laughed at your jokes because none of us really feel that anything that you went through was funny or... And, uh, you know, we are with you throughout. Uh, I, what I wanted to say was that uh, when you talk about academia and fascism, I was recently back at our alma mater two days ago and getting in was like getting into a maximum security prison. It had become like that. What happens when our educational institutions does not allow people to, you know, move freely in and out of the institution, talk freely? Uh, it's one of the worst situations. Do you see any, I mean, I do see that, you know, people have begun to, I mean, even the youthful middle class who are not familiar with, you know, the various issues that are happening in the villages or in the, you know, tribal uh, areas and all that, they have begun to slowly begin to see, uh, you know, I mean, the real truth of what is happening. Maybe on one side, yeah. maybe on one side it is my own sort of uh, optimism. But do you feel that? Do you feel that there is a change in attitude and perceptions of the common people about uh, what is actually happening in India? That it is not as shining as it is supposed to be, or the shining is in some other way. It's shining in some other way. Finally, on the Supreme Court order. 
the only thing I had to state to the press was that uh, uh, I moved out of from a small prison to a larger prison, and uh, all the university campuses become like prison houses now. Uh, I mean, we we come to hear about uh, uh, a dozen universities, names of the a dozen universities, how these campuses are now turned into concentration camps or uh, prison houses uh, but uh, actually if you see the en in the entire country every university is like that. The moment you concentrate and see a particular university then you can understand that the university is You know like uh, uh, I wanted to see like uh, uh, like many people like even uh, uh, Vivi also just said that uh, uh, there is a fascistic uh, tendency uh, today that we are confronting. But I will, I go f a step forward and see that fascism is has already set in. Uh, like, uh, uh, if you see, I mean, what is the indication that we are already living in a fascist, under a fascist state, in under fascism? I mean. Uh, you know the number of uh, intellectuals, writers, and uh, rationalists that were killed and targeted in the last few. I mean, the two years I was there in the prison, I was reading all this new, new in the news. Uh, apart from that, that the greatest indication to see whether you are already under fascist uh, uh, fascism. I mean, fascism is not only the state, but fascism enters into the civil society, then only it is fascism. The civil society in the sense that now you have uh, RSS controlled uh, social elements which are, con which are controlling the society outside the government as part of the uh, state also. That is where you are fascism. That, the best indicator that you will understand is that when the fascism sets in, there is a genocide. Genocide and fascism go together. You have a genocide happening on Adivasis and Muslims, particularly Adivasis. The Operation Green Hand is a, is a, is a project of genocide. You see like uh, under Nazis, there is a genocide of Jews. Fascism always comes along with the genocide. Even before the modern fascism uh, started in the 1930s in Europe, you can see genocides happening and the fascism of different varieties happening through, throughout the colonial period. The colonial rule in different continents established genocides of the Adivasis. Without genocide, no, in nowhere colonial rule consolidated. Today, we have uh, here a, a fascism unleashed in the entire society, and the entire society, and a genocide parallel is going on. And this is the biggest indicator. I mean, don't wait and see there is a fascism of the European type exactly in that in those terms it will happen. This happens here in a different way. Uh, in different forms and shape, but the clear indications that you see is that the voices, younger voices that are coming out of the universities now indicate that they are responding to this fascism. That's precisely why the universities are targeted by the state today. That the, the, the young intellectuals, the students are responding to the fascism in their own way, in their own understanding. And along with that, you can see everywhere there is a kind of, in every university where there is a kind of an attack, you can see that the students there are trying to identify with the larger people and their consciousness to raise against fascism. So this is the times of, no, actually, where you can also see positive uh, thing and you can also see within that positive thing that the things to, the things that are shaping us the fascist I would say that even if it was not BJP 
and NDA who is ruling today, even if it was Congress who voted power back to her, the same thing would have happened. It was irrespective of the party. And the same RSS would have acted in the same way. Congress would have been ruling with and helping the same RSS. Uh, it was not because of Modi or BJP or NDA, but it is the entire ruling class in the same block you see, whether it is NDA or UPA or whichever, the same fascism would have been unleashed and, and the same genocide would have continued. The genocides, in fact, they started uh, during UPA period itself. And so, but we have a great opportunity today, unlike what happened in um, Europe. Europe, the workers were also organized into a fascist party. The, uh, I mean, all the uh, sections, poorer sections were organized by the fascist Nazi party. Today, we are not in such a condition. We have people's movements of a wide variety. I mean, to use uh, the, the, the phrase of uh, Arundhati Roy, there is a rainbow of people's movements in this country. And uh, there is a possibility that for all of us, there is a great opportunity, all the campuses can unite now. All the students, in fact, there is a victory. Uh, I mean, uh, Rohit Vemula, in fact, uh, uh, created a situation for all of us by sacrificing his life that we all are. Uh, no, working into kind of this, uh, uh, it is a kind of a big explosion where we all understood what we should do. He did this, and that's why it's not, I mean, it's not a suicide, it is of course a murder, but before, even that, this kind of a sacrifice of his life has given him a great opportunity to understand what's happening around us, in fact. And he has exploded the situation to make us uh, hear and see the situation. So there is a great opportunity for us all, I mean, this, uh, this, this, I mean, this, the fascist, uh, this thing, and the genocide on the other hand going on, we can see this situation, and we have ample opportunity to react and actually do something to stop this fascism and reverse this fascist tendencies. Still we have opportunities. Unlike in 1930s, there was no opportunity for the progressives and the workers and others in the Europe to stop the fascism, but we still have this opportunity. And I hope that we can all be successful to counter this and stop this at this stage uh, and uh, uh, reverse this uh, fascist uh, uh, answer. No, Sai Baba is from uh, Central University and also then he flew now the University of English and Foreign Languages. And uh, both of uh, those two universities have become now the concentrated camps. And uh, tomorrow he will be visiting his uh, earlier institution, the Central University. Of course, you know the gates are closed. And uh, Rohit Vemula's uh, platform is being er eradicated. You know, the, some the officer was telling that for only technical reasons that the concerned officer is on leave. That's why it could not be erased, but it will be erased and the Veribada will be removed. And that place uh, Sai Baba will be visiting tomorrow, his own institution. And he flew his another insti uh, institution which has also become a concentrated care. And I think a police officer is uh, the vice chancellor of that university. Of course, both. <laughs> Either a or... Uh, what's her name? Uh, huh? Sunayana. Sunayana. Uh, these are the, in fact, these are the police officers, as I used to say about P.V. Uh, Narsaro, that he's an intellectual police. And of course, these two people are not intellectuals also. So this is the situation. Tomorrow we will be visiting this. Thank you very much for the opportunity you have given.